Hi, and welcome to Journey Forward with Jory Rose, where you will gain insights, tools, and inspiration to get unstuck and live your best life. Jory is a licensed marriage and family therapist with a passion for helping people cultivate awareness and authenticity so they can show up fully in all aspects of their life. And now, here's Jory. Hey everyone, welcome back to Journey Forward with Jory Rose. I'm really happy to have Michael Sherlock here with me today. I recently had a conversation with her on her podcast and thought, oh, I just love this connection. I feel like I could talk to you for hours and thought, I need to reciprocate. I want to talk to you again. So here you are. Uh, Michael, thank you so much for joining us. Please introduce yourself and tell our listeners a little bit about who you are and how you show up in the world. Oh, you got it. Oh, Jory, thank you so much. We did. We had a great time talking and we, we couldn't stop talking. So I know. <laughs> it's, always, it's always good we can have a follow up good, podcast. Good problems uh, to have, I think, right? Absolutely. Well, I, I think I want to start out with, you know, where you, the last question like, how do I show up in the world? Because not just, only do I think jump a, right in. <laughs> exactly. I mean, I think it's such a great premise to, you know, your concept of journey forward because I'm now 52 years old. I think I finally get it, how I want to show up in the world and how, how to do it without, you know, feeling like it's, you know, questioning myself and all those, you know, different things that you have in different times of your life. I finally like, I like my, who I am in my skin. Mm. And so, who, you know, how I try and show up every day is to be authentic to myself, which means, um, you know, I, I, you know, I own a training company. I, I now manage a team of about, you know, eight people, um, actually a total of about 30 right now wow. um, between my two companies. But, um, but what I mean by that is, is I know how I want to operate now. And that's, you know, by doing the right things, like, you know, not just training to train, but training to really change people, you know, to, yes. to also be very honest about my faults, my, my mishaps, my struggles, my failures, um, as well as the things that I've recognized and taken from those to, to move forward. Because, you know, when I go do training, you know, prior to a pandemic, you know, most of the time I was on an airplane and I was traveling somewhere in the world to train people on leadership and sales. And I've always loved that. And I know I'm always authentic when I'm, when I'm there and I'm in the moment, but I think that especially the last few years, it's really pushed me to say, but who are you when you're alone in your own head? Mm. Who are you when you're not on that stage? You know, who are you when you doubt yourself? Who are you when you think, oh my gosh, this is so hard. I don't know if I can do it. And if there's one thing a year of, of completely having all of our worlds turned upside down is done for me is reminded me that I am right where I need to be and my faults, my, my pluses, the good, the bad, and the ugly, I'm okay with them all now. And yeah. I don't know that I would have said that as confidently a year ago. I still was. Thank you, COVID. There. Right. Yeah, I mean, this, yeah. I, I have this conversation with so many people that there's so many gifts that we've learned from the past year. If we are willing to look at them, mm -hmm. right. So many people are too focused on what was taken away from us. Yeah. And I'm not just an eternal optimist. I truly am a believer that the lens through which you look through matters. Yes. And if we look through this lens of what were the gifts I received from this past year, then we're indebted to what we've learned. And the yeah. key is how do we maintain that awareness and gratitude and those lessons yeah. without just going back to what was, but that's a whole other conversation. But I wrote yeah. down as you were talking, who are you when you're alone in your own head? Wow. Like we could just delve in for hours on that. It's such, <laughs> there's a lot a going on in this head. Yeah. <laughs> and if, you know, you guys are just listening, but I have to say, Michael is, she has such a beautiful face, but has the most beautiful shades of purple and blue hair that match her sweater. Like I, it's just, it, it's such a, you have to be confident to be able to show up with your mermaid streaks mm -hmm. as you are in your uniqueness. It reminds me of the book Rainbow Fish I used to read my kids. Oh. Do, you know, do you know that book? I've heard, I, no, I've heard of it. I haven't read it. You though. know what? I think you would love Rainbow Fish. Rainbow Fish had sparkly scales. And mm. the Rainbow Fish was chastised by other fish for her sparkly scales. Oh. And she was ashamed of them. 
and felt embarrassed because she didn't fit into the other fish. And she realized that her sparkle scales is what made her unique and beautiful. And so she ended up, if I'm recalling, because it's been like 15 years since I've read this to my kid, she ended up like pulling off her skills and giving them oh. to others so they could all have a little bit of sparkle in them. Oh, that's beautiful. It is. And I oh. see that in you. Like I see this sparkle <laughs> and this shine, but it's one thing to embody it versus mm-hmm. just show it on the outside. Yeah. And so how did you get to that place? Because at 52, my gosh, wouldn't you just love if we all could take the awareness as Mm. I don't want to venture to say something as bold as awakened ones, but more, a little, maybe a little bit more aware or enlightened or present mm-hmm. in our own selves than we were in our twenties. But wouldn't that have been an amazing gift to tell your 25 or 30 year old self, Hey, there's nothing wrong with you. You're perfect. Just as you are in all that humanness Yeah, is what and makes you, know- you, you, and that's something, nothing is wrong with that. And, you know, I think through my, my life, I've always been really confident on the outside and confident, a lot of confidence still on the inside. I'm not going to say that I didn't, because that would not be true. Um, But I would have bursts of inner confidence followed by huge prolonged periods of self-doubt and self criticism and Mm self-talk. And then I'd get the boost of energy again. Um, I learned it later that it it was really because of depression, but I didn't understand it then. Um, And I didn't understand. And even when I started to understand it, I didn't know how to control it or ride the waves. And, and so it was a really, um, you know, I look back and, and yes, I wish I could have told, you know, Michael at 25, but Michael at 25 would have said, you're right, but I'm awesome. Look, I mean, you know, cause if you would have caught Michael at 25 during the, you know, the confidence, you know, roll of the wave, she would have said, of course, and I'm going to, everything's going to turn out fine. And then if you would have caught her two weeks later, she would have said, I don't believe you. And, and I think that's the, the interesting thing because, and I don't know that I told you the story. We probably didn't even discuss it. When we, when I interviewed you, did I tell you why my hair is the color it is now or the color? It is. Yes. And I'd love for you to share with our listeners, please tell it, tell it again. I think we talked about it offline afterwards. I don't think it was only, yeah. Maybe we did. And because it's to me now such a poignant story for me because I've always been, you know, blonde. I've my my sister's a hair, you know, she did my hair all growing up before, you know, I moved on and had to, you know, be somewhere else and somebody else did my hair. But, you know, I always had, you know, kind of various colors of blonde, you know, and every once in a while I would maybe go red for, you know, once. I think I did that twice. Um, but I remember, uh, it was, I think it's been, been about six years, six or seven years. And I was going through a really tough work situation, Mm -hmm. like really making me question everything about my abilities. And I mean, I had made it all the way, you know, not to the CEO suite in, in corporate America, but, you know, as a VP of sales, I had made it to the top level. Um, and I was paid well, and I had a great responsibility and I was just kicking butt. But I had these other things going on in my work world that were making me question myself and doubt myself. And every day the, the, the burden got heavier on my soul of Mm. what was happening and who I was showing up and what I was trying to do when I was getting there. And I was trying to then behave the way I thought people expected of me. So I was changing and adapting, but not in a good way. And I knew it internally. I felt just everything out. And I had not felt that off in my life for 15 years. Wow. Um, And I went to get my hair done and my hairdresser said, okay, so what color are we doing today? Which meant what color of blonde are we going to go bright blonde, ash blonde, you know, Elsa blonde, you know, (laughs) (laughs) at that time, you know, it was, it was cool to be Elsa. And, uh, and I said, you know what, let's just put navy blue right in the bangs and I, you know, I said it that way, that aggressively, you know, yeah. I made the gesture with my hands. And now I look back and the psychologist, be, you know, upbringing in me says, okay, there's a lot going on there. Well, there was some fuck you in there, huh? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. I just put it right there. Cause that's going to scream. I am not changing, you know? Yeah. And, there's uh, a, there's a and, bold statement of see me yes. and accept me and see me, see me, see yes. me, not, yeah. And, um, and so my, my hairdresser looked at me and she goes, well, we can do that if you're serious. And it was that breath that I took and that when I went, yeah, let's do it. And that day, the strangest 
thing. I mean, I walked home from, you know, it's a mile and a half from my, you know, I, we walk everywhere. We don't own a car. We live in downtown Philly. I'm walking through downtown Philly. It was Halloween. People probably thought I was dressed up for Halloween. Yes. I walked with purpose, man. That was the first time that I had known me in a couple of years. So let me just pause you because there's more yeah. to this. But in that moment, you're walking down Philly. You've got this bright navy blue streak across your vein. Mm. What do you think that color, what do you think that statement allowed you to otherwise do that you couldn't do prior to that? What, what, what did it give you? Um, and you know, it wasn't necessarily about the blue. I don't know why I picked blue. I yeah. just tend to have blue more frequently because I think it's a good color on me, but it, it was my statement of here I am, here I am, me, just who I am. I yeah. am good enough. I don't have to change. Now, I'm not saying I wouldn't be willing to adapt and in working situations, you have to at times, you know, you might sure. have to, to, you know, try a new process you don't like you might your company might be going through, a, you know, a total revamp, there might be all these things happening that you wish weren't happening. But what I was allowing myself, I was allowing all these things around me outside to make me feel like I had to change in ways that were di diametrically opposed to yeah. the core of who I am, especially as a leader. And I think that moment I was like, screw this. I am not, I'm not, I'm not going to go back and be a jerk, but I am not going to doubt myself because somebody yeah. else is trying to beat me into a different, uh, put me into a different corner. And, it well, and there's, everything. there's light, la there's layers to this. And I think, especially as women, we see this, you know, show up in so many different capacities, but I, I think it's a very empowering statement. And I really respect and honor your courage and your authenticity to say, look, I'm willing to adapt where I need to, to fit in. Yes. Like this is, a, we have to learn those skills of adaptation to survive, right? Those yes. are just yes. survival skills to some extent. But if we're adapting to survive in such a way in which our soul is dying on the inside, then yeah. we're not surviving. Then those adaptations yeah. are not for our survival, they're for our very slow death. Yes. Whether that's emotional, mental, you know, some sort of physical way that we are withering away and not standing yeah. in our true power. Yeah. Well, and I fit, you know, I mean, I had a really, you know, serious job in a, in a very kind of traditional, um, uh, you know, environment. Uh, and it was, it was really out of the norm. But when I did that, when I made that decision, I found what I could always say is that it doesn't matter what my hair color is or how crazy this might be. And I have really fun shoes when I'm not wearing slippers during, you know, pandemic stay at home, but it doesn't matter what I look like on the outside. Once you start talking to me or I, you know, come in to do a sales presentation or I train your leadership team, you forget what color my hair is. But my color of hair tells you something about me. It tells you that I'm open. It tells you that I'm willing to listen. It tells you that I'm adaptable. You know, it tells you that there's something fun. And amidst all the seriousness, if we're not having fun with what we're doing, then we will die that slow death. And yeah. I just wasn't willing to do it anymore. And so my, my hair has become my, my, um, I mean, I'll be 90 years old and deciding, okay, today, are we going to go, you know, hot fuchsia? I don't know. Let's figure it out. So um, because it's, can so, I just, it's uh, so freeing. It's so freeing. And I'm curious, cause I, I, I want to ask the question before I make the statement for myself, have you gotten feedback from people who you've worked with in that very kind of corporate setting about how they interpreted that um, early yes on, no. especially. Yeah. Yeah. Early on, there were a lot of wide eyes, a lot of wide eyes, a lot of, oh my God, what's going to happen to her? So there were a lot of people that maybe didn't ask the question or didn't say anything directly, but the wide eyes spoke because the wide eyes said, we don't do this in this environment and what's going to happen to her. And then when they realized that not only did, you know, nothing happen, I actually moved on from where I was with that company and, you know, went and took on another challenge at another company, never even mentioned my hair color as I'm, you know, interviewing with the guy who flew over from Denmark, you know, to interview me, he yeah. was probably wide eyed too. <laughs> but I'm like, look, this is just part of who I am. And I think what it's been interesting is that in the years after that, people have said, I'm so whatever, impressed. I was so awed. I was so inspired. Um, and I, I've heard a lot of, I can't do that. 
Yeah. I could never do that. And my question is, could never do what? Well, I could never dye my hair that way. Well, do you want to? Well, gosh, I'd always love to. Well, then why can't you? I mean, here's the thing. Even if you feel like you can't show up this way every day at work, you can buy stuff and spray it on on the weekend. You can. It comes right yeah. out. There's great stuff at CVS. I have plenty of them that you know, <laughs> fill things in when it gets a little boring. But you can. Um, but I remember talking to a gal who is a, a bank vice president. And she said, I could never do that. I could never do that. And I said, you know, you've got really long hair. Just for the heck of it. Buy some stuff yourself and put it underneath and just have it hidden so that you know it's there. Your little secret. And yeah. just see what happens. And I'll tell you, she emailed me back about six months later. She goes, not only did I do that and I felt so free, I started wearing it up. And she goes, my job wasn't in jeopardy. And it's not about whether or not you color your hair. No, you know, of course not. You don't but that's to. what I was going to say. I'm like, you know, Michael, we're talking about hair color, but this really isn't a conversation about hair color. Exactly. It's exactly. <laughs> and I hope all you guys listening understand that, well, this is, yes, on the surface about hair color, this is something so much deeper mm -hmm. about who, how we show up. Right. So that really was a poignant question that I start off in yeah. our, you know, almost all my interviews is how do you show up in the world? But the question becomes much deeper when we yeah. recognize that how I show up is actually a physical embodiment of my inner message of my inner voice of my outer confidence, whatever yeah. it is. Cause you know, one of the things that especially we all do, we all have it on our own ways, but especially as women, I think we have a silent set of rules that we feel we have to abide by, whether yes. in our families or in business situations, right? I mean, this is no news to anybody, but the, the statement of, I, I can't do that mm -hmm. is such mm -hmm. a powerful one. And, you know, oh, yeah. when I look at you and now I'm going back to the, the hair color concept, but what it represents is I even just have this thought of on some levels, I'm so jealous of her courage <laughs> and jealous is an interesting word because it implies envy. It's not about that. It, right. I wish I at times could step into the things and how I want to fully express myself when I don't know that. I can easily do that. And a lot of those barriers are my own imposed barriers, right? And that's the challenge. Yeah. Yeah. No one has said, Jory, you can't say or do these things. Right. It's, it's, the, it's the barriers that we perceive or keep holding up out of our own fears or anxieties or, you know, whatever it might be. Yeah. And, well, and I think it's, it, it's a beautiful it, statement. In that day that, you know, I said, yes, let's do it. I mean, there was no courage in that. That was that was almost a clinging to a life raft and seeing, seeing a, um, a, you know, a coast guard boat coming by yeah. and saying, I'm so exhausted. I could either just cling to this raft and slowly drift off into the sunset and no one will see yeah. it because if I don't wave my hands, coast guard might, boat might not see me and might go right by me. Yeah. And at that moment I was like, no, I need, I need to be saved. I need to save myself. And that was the day it was, you know, to me, no courage. It was sheer, like my last moment to hold on to who I was because mm. I was afraid I wasn't going to exist anymore. Yeah. And now, you know, I mean, every day, every day I get colored, you know, it was funny when I first started getting it done and I, you know, try different things and different colors. And my husband, one day I came back and we'd done something kind of, you know, uh, light pinks and light purple or light blue something. And it was real kind of pretty, but real light. And my husband said, I said, don't you like it? And he goes, mm, it's too subtle. <laughs> and I said, really, what do you mean? He goes, it's not you. You're trying, mm -hmm. you're, you're put, you're trying to put it under a bushel again. He goes, mm -hmm. it's just not you. And I went, so now that's the measure point. So whenever I get my hair done, my, my, uh, you know, stylist and everyone in the salon, they're like, all right, we're going to make sure this is not subtle, whatever it's going to yeah, be. Yeah, it's not yeah. going to be subtle. <laughs> I love that. I love that. And it, you know, it inspires the question for people to ask themselves, am I exuding on the outside what I'm feeling on the inside? And if I'm yeah. not, what's, what's preventing me? Yeah. Yeah. Because and you it's, mentioned it's really hard. You mentioned for you, um, you know, in the kind of the beginning of what you were saying that underneath some of it was depression that you didn't realize that it was depression. Yeah. Um, I know so many of our listeners, you know, manage with their uh, mental and emotional health 
And mm-hmm. as a therapist, this is what I'm here to teach people, right? Mm-hmm. But it's fascinating to recognize, wait, I wouldn't have ever even labeled it as that. Yeah. So can you feel um, comfortable to share maybe what, what that was like for you in the awareness to recognize, oh, wait, maybe this is depression. What did you think it was otherwise? And what did you do with that awareness once you had, because I, I, I'm, this is just my bias. I have a really uncomfortable relationship with labels, especially Mm -hmm. in the mental health field, because I think for the majority of diagnoses and labels, they don't serve us Yeah, because people can get stuck in the label itself and in the box of the label. But at the same time, the label is very helpful because it gives us, oh, wait, I I understand myself a little bit better. This makes sense to me. Okay, now that I know that there's a name to what I'm experiencing, I now know there's something I can do with that. Um, So it begins to shift. So can you, you know, share what you what what your journey looks like in that moment of that awareness? Yeah. And so I think to do it, I just I need to go back a little further because um, at 17 was the first time I made plans to kill myself. And I was I didn't know that was pre, it was actually, I think probably right around the same year that Prozac was, uh, you know, released. And so depression wasn't talked about. You didn't talk about that. We didn't use the term depression. I didn't know I had depression. Um, Mm. I just knew that I I would hurt inside so bad that I thought killing myself was the only way to not hurt. Yeah. And I got past that point, luckily, because I reached out to somebody right before I, I finished with take, not finished, but right before I began taking the 56 little brown pills wow. that were pain medications that I had had allergic reaction to that I knew would kill me. I mean, there was no mm. doubt. I knew. So I reached out to somebody at the very end and luckily they, they interceded, but my parents, God love them. They didn't, um, they didn't know what depression was either. They just, they yeah. thought I was trying to get attention. So in my early, my late teens, my early twenties, it was something I tried to hide was this balance of when I was depressed and when I, you know, the emotion and the anxiety. And then I became a mother and, you know, kind of life, you know, carried on. And in my late twenties was the next time that life was so bad. And I was going through my divorce um, it was so bad that I contemplated it again. And very clearly, I know exactly the moment I was going to open the car door. My dad was driving the car. We were coming back from the first court hearing and I saw a truck coming the other way. And I knew that if I opened the car door and fell out, I'd be dead. Mm. That's when I started getting counseling, yeah. <laughs> thankfully. And so through that period of time um, of my life in my late twenties and my thirties, I learned a lot. I learned to understand myself. I learned to talk to myself. I learned to talk to other people, which I'd never done before. But I found out that I was also hypoglycemic. And I found out that when I managed my blood sugar levels, so I didn't have spikes, I didn't have the same, uh, I didn't deal with, I didn't have depression. Like I literally, I would have ups and downs, but like- Sure, well, you're still human, right? Exactly. Um, and I remember one time I said to my counselor, I said, I think I'm depressed again. And he said, no, you are having a a fluctuation. He goes, but here's how I know the difference. And we talked through it. I'm like, you're right. I'm just, you know, it's scary when I'm dealing with ups and downs. Um, so I learned to manage my, this part of me for all these years. And so flash forward to, you know, the day I'm sitting in the hairdresser's uh, chair. And as I walked out and I was walking home that day, I realized that all the things that I had been, I had started doing something I used to do. And I used to, I used to call it stuff. And I physically, you know, show my hands, like I'm stuffing. Yeah. If there's a Pushing bad emotion, down. I stuff it down and I stuff it down. If I feel hurt or angry, I stuff it down. If I feel scared, I stuff it down. And when I started walking and people were smiling and, you know, nodding at my hair and saying, I like your hair, which is a funny thing. All of a sudden, it was like a release on that, and I started to yeah. really re, uh, realize that no matter how good my my diet was, then it couldn't compensate for how much stuffing I had done, mm-hmm. and now it just couldn't be. Con- I I I had to either completely let it go and deal with it, or I wasn't going to make it through it. And yeah. so that 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 moment where I go, oh, this is depression again. 
I have been in the middle of it. I didn't recognize it because I thought I was doing other things. And I've been working so hard to look perfect on the outside and stuffing yeah. everything down. And that you can me. have the awareness, but the patterns didn't change. Two right. different things. Yeah. Two very, very different things. And it takes a long time to rewire those patterns. Oh, yeah. I mean, you, as I always say, you can't change what you're not aware of, right? So awareness has to be the first step. It yeah. is always the first step. And it's also the hardest step because once you become oh, yeah. aware, you can't you go back, something. right? That Pandora's right. box is now open. And, you know, as I always say, with awareness comes responsibility. Yeah. Well, that, that, that's the goal. That's the intention, right? You have that yeah. you are now going to take action towards whatever you now are aware of. And, but that takes time. So what a fascinating yes. journey to recognize I I thought I was dealing with this, but oh, look at that. I'm actually still doing yes. that pushing down. Yeah. And I was, and that's when I found meditation and, you know, and it was. So how old were you at this point? Uh, so seven years ago, what's 52 by 45? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. We've math been doing math in this show. <laughs> Yeah. 45. Okay. Yeah. So how did you stumble upon meditation? You know, I, oh, I know, uh, strangely enough. So I love watching good morning America and one of the, uh, anchors on the Saturday morning, one Dan Harris had written a book oh, called yes. 10% happier. Yes. And very public display of panic attacks. Yes. Yes. And anxiety uh -huh. attacks. And, uh, so when I, I thought, you know, well, I like him, I'm going to read, I'm going to read his book. And I read the book and I thought, there's something in this that I need. And I'm by the way, it. for those of you who have not read the book, it is a phenomenal book for yeah. an entree into mindfulness and meditation. Yes. What Dan Harris so beautifully describes in this book is resistance yes. to mindfulness and meditation and how the resistance itself is the very thing to prevent you. I mean, it seems I, not ironic, right? But he yeah. did, his account of his resistance kept him in suffering. Yeah, yeah. And when you begin to lower that resistance to wait, this can actually help me? Yeah. You mean it's not just magic, I can actually do this? Yeah. But yeah, for those listening, if, if you need some great starting point, that book is a great starting point. So please continue. It really it really is, especially because he details, like, here's why I didn't believe this. And here's why, yeah. you know, they kept sending me on these stories. And I'm like, why are you doing this to me? You know, this yeah. is painful. I don't want to do it. Until the point where he actually took himself on a one week silent meditative retreat. And his wife's like, what are you doing? You only get a few weeks a year. Why are you leaving us? Yeah. And, uh, and that was really my, my ent entree to it. So, okay. you know, I, that gave me the opportunity and I used his app and then I found a different app and, you know, so kind of changed and evolved. Um, and in the beginning, because I was so busy, I was really hesitant to do doing anything more than a few minutes at a time. I, you know, I hadn't got my brain uh, used to having more peaceful moments and longer moments. And that was okay though. I mean, to start out and just doing one minute meditations. Well, I, and, and that is something I'm so glad that you did that, Michael, because mm -hmm. People have said to me for years, you know, but I can't do it for longer. Great. Then don't, then don't, then, mm -hmm. you know, th this is a misconception that to mm -hmm. effectively meditate. And in fact, when I first was learning these tools and I, I was on retreat with John Kabat-Zinn, who's like mm -hmm. the teacher yeah. and, you know, everything was, I was taught was you had to meditate for 20 to 40 minutes a day for it to be effective. And I'm like, I'm sorry, that's bullshit. <laughs> I call <laughs> bullshit on that. And to no yeah. disrespect of my teachers and the tradition, but I knew if that was the expectation, I didn't have that kind of time. And if right. I did, it was not going to be spent in meditation, yeah. but I also knew I needed it. Yeah. And so it's, I think, you know, for you to be able to say, I can do a minute and that's effective and that's a great starting yeah. point. And, you know, I mean, it's like, if you know that you should do 25 push ups a day, but you haven't done a push up since, you know, grade school, you don't start with 25 push-ups. you start with one yes. <laughs> and then maybe a couple more after that. And, and that I think was what, after I, you know, did so many guided ones that were, you know, a minute, then I kind of got to three minute ones and five minute ones. Then I wanted more. Yes. I wanted more. Um, and it's like, and Oh, that now, feels good. Give me more of that. Yeah. And now I do, um, at least once a day, 
and sometimes twice a day, I do a 40 minute guided hypnosis Beautiful. meditation. And I do it. I mean, there's a lot of times, I mean, it's almost my afternoon. There's a lot of times that around three o'clock in the afternoon, I am like, everything is starting to, I'm getting exhausted. My brain is, you know, so instead of feeling bad and pushing through, I will go and I will do this 38 minute meditation that's called raise your energy. And it, you know, puts you into deep, nice trance, but as you come back out of it, you know, and it wakes you up, I'm like, okay, I'm ready. And I can tackle another hour and a half, two hours of my, my day and feel phenomenal. But so many times I would just keep powering through that. Oh, it's too late in the day. I can't take a break. I can't do yeah. whatever. And I'm annoyed at myself like tomorrow and next week on Tuesday, I overbooked myself. And I know it, and I'm trying to move around something tomorrow because, and I don't know if I can right now, but I try really hard to make sure there's always that window in the day in case I need it. Yeah. And that's the thing is that's taking care of myself at a whole different level. And that is really not trying to make excuses for myself or not trying to push myself or not feeling guilty about doing something good for myself. It's about understanding that my body and my mind tell me when it's time to do or not do something. And I better start listening. (laughs) Well, and look at what you've been able to shift when you start listening to your body, because how many of us intuitively know this and still don't do it? Yep. You know, and honestly, to, I, I, I couldn't believe it yesterday because I usually, when I know my day is at a certain point, I block things off so nobody else can, can get in there. And I realized somebody jumped in with an appointment tomorrow and I was like, oh, it's my fault. I did it. It's, I'm going to have to power through it. But the rest of the week, I've already cleared it out. So I don't have any more problems. Yes. With it. And but for next Tuesday, I think I've already got almost all of it done. <laughs> yeah, well, and part of the challenge there, you know, the, the word that's coming to me as I listen to this is the importance of boundaries. Yes. I was yes. recently listening to a Brene Brown podcast episode with a woman named Susan David, I think was her name. And they were talking about compassion fatigue. And Mm -hmm. how those who don't experience compassion fatigue are those who are very clear and discerning with their boundaries. Yes. And that when we don't have boundaries, we take in and we take on way too much. But with boundaries, we know our own limits. And it becomes a deep act of self-care and also role modeling. Because I, I, I think, you know... In our American society, we are cultivated in this belief, right? That glorification of busyness. And it becomes this unfortunate badge of honor. Look how busy I am. I must be so important. And the flip side of that is if you slow down, the perception is you're lazy. When in fact, it's the slowing down that gives you the energy to keep going. Yeah. I had somebody, um, I had somebody email me, this was a few weeks ago and they emailed me like about six fifteen, And I remember seeing it because I heard my phone ding. And usually I turn my ringer off after I shut down at five 30 or so. And so I didn't respond. It wasn't urgent anyway, but I, when I emailed her back the next day, I said, I'm sorry, I didn't respond yesterday. I don't reply to emails after 6 PM. And when we talked, she goes, Wow how do you do that? I said, I just had to stop because work won't stop. My email doesn't stop. And I said, it is important. She goes, well, I don't know how to do that sometimes. I said, well, I'll, you know, I don't know how to tell you how to do it. I just started doing it. My life was a whole lot better because if I don't, then there, then there's no break. There's no personal in my life. And it's really important to me. This, this marriage that I have right now is amazing. And I don't want to screw it up. I want to spend time with my husband. I want to make sure that our relationship is sound. And if I'm still answering emails at six o'clock at night, I am not prioritizing our relationship. Yeah. It's such a beautiful reminder. I I recently participated in an online summit and there was going to be a speaker kind of little round table in addition to the summit, but it was going to take place over the weekend. And I said Mm -hmm. to the woman, I said, you know what? Um, Thank you so much for wanting to include me. And I've created the boundary that I don't, I don't work on the weekends like this. And she was like, wow, Mm -hmm. thank you for your boundary. And so it's interesting that I think, especially when we feel we're stuck in our shoulds that we have to show up in a certain way and the fear is we're going to be rejected for that boundary. But the irony is, wow, like maybe I'm actually role modeling to others. Yeah, exactly. How to do the same thing. Because like you said, they're like, wait, I can't do that. 
<laughs> and but I think it's a matter of how we own it. If we say it apologetically, then yes. we don't feel like we're standing in our true authenticity around it. If we own it with pride yeah. of I'm really proud of myself. This is sometimes hard for me to do and you yeah. know, there'll be times where there's certain days I can have seven to eight clients back to back with hardly any breaks. Yeah. And as a therapist who does all work virtual now, my clients are a combination of Zoom, FaceTime, and just regular oh. phone calls. Yeah. And the ones that I have phone calls, I will often go take a walk. Mm -hmm. And sometimes if I'm outside, there might be some cars passing by as I get to my path. And I'll apologize. Hey, I'm really sorry for the noise. It'll only be just a minute. But you know what? I'm role modeling self-care to you right now. Like yeah, I'm, I'm yeah. fully present with you just because there's some outside noise. Yeah. And I'm also role modeling to you that you need to be taking care of yourself. Because if me as your therapist is sitting in my chair for eight straight hours and not getting up to move my body, I'm not in best service of you. Right. Absolutely. And no one has ever been like, that's not professional. Um, yeah. They're like, oh, okay, thanks. And, and I've had some clients like, okay, great. You know what? I'm going to go take a walk too while we talk. Yeah. But even during COVID, there were times where we would Airbnb just to get, you know, a different view. And there yeah. was one where we were <clears throat> um, on, on a house that had a, was on a, um, a lake and had a boat. And I saw all my clients from sitting on the boat that week. <laughs> <laughs> and they're like, wait, is that water behind you? And I'm like, yeah, yes. this is me role modeling self-care. Like this is yeah. me knowing that what I needed was to get a break. And I can still work, but this is me doing self-care right now. Because people yeah. don't get enough permission of the self-care. Yeah, absolutely. They get too much role modeling of just the pushing through and the stuffing down. Right, right. Yeah, and that makes you look more effective. Well, my husband used to call it with me. He uh, when we first, um, when I first moved here. Um, so when I my where I lived before in Washington State, so clear across the country, I'm the last of six kids. I was the glue. I organized mm. all the holiday meals. I, you know, organized when it's time to open the cabin and, you know, all these things. And I didn't realize how exhausted I was. Yeah. And even as we moved across, moved me across country, it was like, I could feel myself breathing again. And for a while I felt really guilty about that. But my husband always said, not just about my family, but without, about other people, he's like, are you trying to save puppies? And so that's his thing. Are you saving puppies? You know, and that was just his nice way of saying, are you doing all these things because you really want to? Or are you doing them because you feel you have to, to save yes. puppies? And so it's fun because now I don't think he's asked me that question except for the, you know, it's, I mean, it's been eight, nine years since he's asked me if I'm saving puppies. <laughs> and that makes me very proud of myself because it's really about sometimes you do, like sometimes you have to say, hey, in this case, I'm doing this to save puppies but I'm very well aware that that's what I'm doing at the moment. Yes. Just be aware that you're doing it. Do it on purpose versus out of habit or out of obligation or the damn yes. shitting on yourself. Exactly. And so sometimes I'm like, yes, I am right now, but I've gone into this consciously. I'm going to do it and then I'm going to be done. And, uh, you know, and it, it's just a great reminder of what control I do have because then I don't feel mad at somebody else because I'm right. saving their puppies for them. I can look at myself and say, okay, you did this, you've decided this, then do it, finish it and move on. And then and yes. feel good that you made that conscious choice. I, I love this, Michael, so much. So how is all of this personal growth that you have, have, for all of us, has been a lifelong practice, but you've really embodied some very tangible steps along the way. How has this affected your ability to, to do your work in, in leadership training? How has that translated in your career? And have you shown up any differently in how you train? Absolutely. Oh my gosh, so much. I mean, I've always been very reflective, self-reflective as a leader. And I think that's, and that was really the premise behind my first book. Um, you know, on, Hold on. First you, you, you just dropped that pot. Okay. Pause name of oh. your book. When was that? <laughs> So my first acknowledge book, all accomplishments of written yes, published there you books. Go. <laughs> so my very first book is called Tell Me More, How to Ask the Right Questions and Get the Most Out of Your Employees. And mm. both my books are written like novels. So the characters are, people are always like, are you Maria or are you Jane? And I'm like, you tell me. But uh -huh. really all the characters are different parts of me throughout my career. Um, but it's all about 
how you reflect and how you how you ask people more questions mm-hmm. than you try to tell them. And, you know, how do you guide people? Well, you do it by sharing your own stories and you, and by encouraging them and, and pulling things out. So I know that um, all this journey has made me much better because I had to get better or else I, you know, as a leader, especially when I was leading as many as 500 people that wow. you can, you can kill yourself pretty quickly that way. Yeah. Um, and then my second book is called sales mixology. Why the most potent sales and customer experiences follow a recipe for success. And that's, you know, that's, that's more about, you know, the customer interaction, but it's the same thing. It's about talking, questioning and and being present. Um, But I'll tell you just for where I am as a leader. So I own two companies now. I own uh, Shock Your Potential, which is our global leadership um, training and development company. And so I have a team of eight people. They're all virtual. They're all out of Kenya. We actually have a second company called Kukwa Biz, where we match other talented people from Kenya with small businesses all over the world. So I have about, you know, between those, I have about 30 people in the mix right now. Beautiful. But with my team, with my team with Shock Your Potential, just the other day, I realized that my team wasn't all working at the same level. I had some that were giving everything and some that I just knew were not giving enough. And I had you know, your first reaction as a leader is like, well, why, why aren't they giving me everything? You know, what's, what, don't they care? Don't they want this job? What's, you know, what's the deal? And then I went, look, Sherlock. And whenever I call myself Sherlock, you know, we're going to have a talking to him. I'm like, Sherlock, <laughs> like, look at the mirror. Cause something in here is not their fault. There's yeah. something here that's your fault. What is it? Let's, uh, let's dive in. And I realized I hadn't shared enough of my vision with them. I hadn't told mm. them about more of the history of the business or how, you know, how much, uh, you know, I mean, since I've had my company, I've never taken a paycheck out of my own company. Um, I've invested everything back in to build us to the next level. And I'm fine. I'm lucky. I can do that. Right. Um, This year will be the changing year where I will begin to pay pay myself, which is going to be fun. But I mean, those were conscious choices. I wanted them to understand that. I wanted to understand that I have eight people who work for me when instead of those eight people, I could have been paying myself a lot of money. Yeah. So what, you know, I wanted them to understand that I wanted them to feel a part of it. So I actually sent them a video and I told them this story. I told them about why I started the company. I told them about, you know, and I, and I got to the meat of it and I said, look, I need you guys to decide, are you really a part of this team? Do you want to be a part of the team? Because some of you are working really hard and some of you aren't. Mm-hmm. And I need you guys to reflect. And I'll tell you, we had the best, I sent it to him the day before we had our team meeting and we had an amazing discussion where they're like, well, first we were afraid you were firing us all. And I said, fair enough. I can see that would free to freak anybody else out. Sure. And they're like, But then we, then we listened to you. And every one of them said, I thought that message was just for me. Mm. So you spoke exactly to their soul. Each one of them, even the ones that have been working their tails off. And what I've seen from my team in the last two weeks, it's been incredibly crazy wow. growth from all of them. Um, and I just sent them another message today saying, I'm really proud of what you guys have done in the last couple of weeks. Now let's talk about where we go from here. Um, yeah. But as a leader, I guess it's a long way to say that as a leader, I have to look at my own journey and I have to share it with them. And I do, mm-hmm. I'm very honest. They, you know, they watch Every, you know, I do a Monday motivation video, which is usually about my struggles. You know, I want them to listen to my podcast when I'm on with other people where they're hearing my story, not just, you know, our guests of our regular podcast. And I think it's, you know, they're getting it like, okay, then to be a leader, it's not just to sit on the mountaintop. It's to understand your struggles along the way and embrace them as a part of you. And if you do, it doesn't mean you like everyone. doesn't mean you made a perfect journey. But that's how you continue to learn and evolve and grow. And so for me, you know, whether or not I'm working with my own team or I'm standing in front of a thousand people talking about how to be a better leader, it's the same thing. It's that openness, that vulnerability to say, hey, this is not about putting on an image. This is about doing the hard work. It's hard work to be a leader. It's hard work to be a human. I was just going to say the very same thing. It's It's hard work to be a human. Yeah. And when we need to draw upon our deepest strengths, it, it I you know, I, I come back to parts of the definition of self-compassion as Kristen Neff talks about. And one of the aspects of that is common humanity. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And when we can remember our humanness as the thing that connects us and not divides us, then our yeah. potential is unlimited. It, it, it sounds a little bit cheesy to, you know, and a little kumbaya and it's a hundred percent true. I agree. I agree. I agree. And I know that you are relaunching an app. So tell me more 
about, <laughs> see how I dropped that right there? I love it. I love <laughs> it. I love right, it. Tell, tell us about your app. Yeah. And so just one quick, you know, reflection, you know, um, last year when the pandemic hit, you know, all of a sudden at that point in time, 95% of my business income came from me getting on an airplane, traveling someplace in the world to speak and train. And overnight it was gone. Yeah. And not going to lie, I kind of curled up into a ball, stuck my thumb in my mouth and, you know, yep. crawled into the fetal position and held there for a little while going, oh my God, what are we going to do? And then I got up and said, Which, Sherlock. Which by the way is great self-care just to pause and say, I just need to like have some self-comfort here to say, I don't know what to do. <laughs> yeah. And I needed to grieve. I needed yes. to grieve that, that that was something was changing because we, I had worked so hard to get where I was last year. And I mean, I had it would be inauthentic. Year. It would be inauthentic not to grieve that. Exactly. But once I did, I was like, okay, Sherlock, you can't be stuck here. So what are you going to do? Well, I'd always wanted to develop an app so that we could have different ways to train people. So I said, we're going to put this in the shock your potential app. So people can just look for shock your potential. You'll see our pretty logo, download it. Um, right now, about 80% of the content is free. Um, though there's a, uh, executive membership that's $6 a month that gives you more content and more coming in that one, uh, over the months to come, but it's really about people who want to continue to evolve their career. Um, mm-hmm. if they're entrepreneurs, um, you know, maybe they're trying to figure out where they're going and, and it's such a joy to put it in a different format so that if I never get on an airplane again to go speak and train, if everything's virtual from now on, I'm still reaching people in a really unique way. And yeah. uh, so we've had a lot of fun. We launched it last fall. We've taken all the feedback, we've revamped it. And then I'm, I'm actually making all the final changes this week for our official you know, Amazing. relaunch. And yeah, I'm really, really proud of it because it's, it's something that to me shows that I can evolve, but it also is something I always wanted to do, but I was so busy being successful in one aspect Mm -hmm. that sometimes when you're being fed one way, you forget that sometimes you need to have some alternate food sources and it will spark. So, you know, this time last year, we had one primary source of income. Now we have nine and those nine are are through a variety of online programs, different kinds of speaking, um, a lot of affiliate relationships, different things within the app. And so the future is bright. And I am so thankful that a pandemic, you know, still allowed me to do what I want to do, um, grow my companies in different ways and, um, and really find out what I was made out of in a different level. Well, and, and what a beautiful opportunity because now your reach is unlimited where, yeah. you know, even when you thought you were at the height of your career and you kind of made it in terms of yeah. what you thought that that root marker was mm-hmm. and your ability to pivot in creativity, because, you know, even with the history of depression, it could have been really easy to let that re- perceived as a roadblock just stop you yeah. and turn you around. And oh, yeah. I often will, will use the phrase, you know, what if the roadblock is really just a speed bump? Yeah, exactly. You know, and when we slow down and we just take this breath and we can be able to realign with our purpose and our value and our, why am I doing what I'm doing? And what's at the core of what I want to do? And it sounds like at the core of what you want to do is help people to meet their potential. Exactly. Exactly. And it doesn't always have to be from a stage. I love that. I mean, I really enjoy that. That's something that makes me very happy. Um, but it also exhausts me, you know, yes. traveling all the time. And and you put me up on a stage for an hour and I will give you every ounce of who I am. And then yeah. I'll need to sleep for, you know, 10 hours. <laughs> yep. <laughs> Michael, I have so thoroughly enjoyed our conversation today, and there's so many aspects that I think are so relevant, not just to women in general, but to leaders and to where we are in the world right now. Mm. And I think it's going to be a really fascinating time as we enter. I, 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 my prediction is 2021 and 2022 are going to be really fascinating to observe of how we re-enter the world um, yeah. post-pandemic, because I don't know how long it's going to be till we're fully post-pandemic, but we're somewhere in the midst of current, pre and post, right? Right. Um, and it's it's truly my hope that people move forward intentionally yeah, and not too. just go back into these old patterns of this is the way I used to do it. So that's the only way it has to be done. And I think the story of your hair and like everything we talked about is an example of how we can show up differently 
than we ever did before. And what feels like I'm just, you know, having to force myself to do something, it's really, we can embody it and embrace it and be excited about it. Right. Absolutely. Absolutely. And we should. And I think that, you know, remember, not many people really think about this, but um, after the Spanish flu, our last major pandemic, we had the roaring 20s. Yes. And that was people saying, it's time to live. It's time to show ourselves in a new way. It's time to, you know, feel like we are, you know, we're just in this. And I think that that's, it's a great opportunity for all of us to say, what part of me have I not been embracing and sharing with the world? Because if, if it's there and I haven't fully, sh- you know, showed it, man, it's just waiting to get out. And what would happen if I let it? Yes. It's the good side of what if, what if it actually works out? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> we need to flip the whole what if to have like the positive spin. Yeah, like, what well, win? Adore- what win? Yes. <laughs> yes, I, I adore you. And thank you so much for coming on. How can people find you? And what's the best way to catch? We'll have all this in the show notes as well. But what's the best way people can access your your tools and your offers? Absolutely. Look at shockyourpotential.com. It's the easiest way to find everything we've got going on. But don't forget, look up shock your potential in your your app store download it boom you'll just the colors alone in my logo will make you happy just go for it oh i'm sure they will (laughs) all right michael it's been such a pleasure um thanks so much for being on and hope you guys all got some great value out of this very authentic and uh fun conversation thanks so much to continue your journey forward find jory rose on facebook and instagram to become part of her growing community You can also gain access to her meditations, books, online classes, or to sign up for an upcoming retreat, visit her at joryrose.com. That's J-O-R-E-E-R-O-S-E dot com.